Hey, good morning. It's uh, Saturday, May 11th, and welcome to Everyday Talk 24-7. Actually doing the Q&A Friday this morning, uh, because last night I got distracted by the Northern Lights. And uh, there's a picture of it on your screen right now. Wow. Totally unexpected. Uh, such a brilliant display of uh, God's grace. So anyway, that's why we're doing Q&A Friday this morning. Um, again, love your questions and thoughts. Got three good ones, and uh, we're going to get right to them. First one is from Donnie. And Donnie, I always thank you for your uh, good questions and thoughts. So G Donnie says, Jay, this question came to mind. I do believe the Bible is the infallible Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. My question is, can someone say they are saved and not believe the Bible is infallible? I believe believing the Bible is infallible is a result of regeneration. In the culture, you can hear more and more that the Bible contradicts itself. And that's true, Donnie, it is. So, again, thanks for the really good question. One thing that's important to be realized about being saved is that we are saved by the work of Christ. First, Second Corinthians 5.21 says, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the basis of my salvation, your salvation, is not that we have everything perfectly straight doctrinally. However, if you do believe that the word of God is not really from God, then that is a serious challenge to the credibility of your faith. If you doubt the scriptures, that they don't come from the hand of God at all, that's not something you can have very much confidence about. But if you're a person who would believe that there might be some small errors in the Bible, but that what the Bible says about God, attributes of God, the way of salvation, that those things are true and without error, that would be an issue that I would challenge, but I don't think that necessarily would challenge the credibility of faith. It might just be an area where you're off on. So, Donnie, you're right. We need to be concerned about this, but we just, it, again, everything, there's so many nuances, so I can't make a rule here. But if you actually doubt the credibility of what God says, you doubt the things that are in Scripture, particularly regarding the salvation, then I think that's a serious cause for concern about whether your faith is real or not. However, like I say, if there, if there are some small issues that are there, and again, small in quotes, but you don't have any reservations about the fundamental basis of faith, I think that's a different issue. Donnie, you're also right that there continues to be challenges to the authority of Scripture, and they are increasing, it seems. But here's a passage in John 16, 12 to 15 that is really helpful to me. And it brings me great confidence in the reliability and the inerrancy and fallibility of Scripture. Jesus is speaking, and he says to the disciples, I still have many more things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak and will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and disclose it to you. All the things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. In other words, the Holy Spirit is taking the truth of Jesus, the words he hears from Jesus, and putting those into the mouth and the hands of the people that wrote the scriptures. So that, that's a tremendous confidence to me. The fact that Jesus teaches and is working with the Holy Spirit, that is what determines our Bible. That gives me great faith and hope. Wonderfully comforting. The Bible is an intricate, detailed accounting of history, law, prophecy, poetry, wisdom, and biographies 
of a vast and varied collection of people. It's not, it's, not a, it's not an encyclopedia book. It's not a dictionary. It's a living, breathing document. It comes from the perspective of many writers. The nuances and details that one writer may choose to emphasize may be different than what another writer emphasizes. This, to me, only adds to the amazing work of literature that is our Bible. And but Donnie, yes, our Bible is inerrant, infallible, and able to be used by God's Spirit to bring us to faith and honor to Him. So I hope that helpful was helpful to you. And uh, again, give me thoughts and feedback on this. Thanks so much for asking the question. Next question is from Julie. Julie, I always love hearing from you. And Julie makes, as she says, I have a question. In James chapter 5, verse 14, why do you think Jesus, James said to anoint him with oil? I know this was an old custom and tradition, but when I read, a, when I read about what Jesus healed people, when he healed people, when he healed people, I don't remember him doing that as an example of healing people. That is doing, you know, anointing with oil. I don't remember reading anywhere where other apostles anointed with oil before they healed someone. This has always stuck out to me. I love your thoughts. Again, great, great, great question, Julie. Here's the passage that you're referencing. It's in James 5, 13 to 15. Is there anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He has to sing praises. He has to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Such, such, such an amazing summary here. I was tempted to jump into that, but I, I won't. But uh, this is so amazing. So anyway, if someone's sick, they call for the elders to pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. This is a, again, a, 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 such a rich passage of Scripture. And Julie, you're right to bring this up, this whole whole issue of the anointing with oil. Uh, a lot of folks do that because of what, what the passage appears to say. But the Greek word here for uh, anointing with oil is Alephel, which is also used in Luke 10, verse 34. And this is with the story of the Samaritan, Good Samaritan. And after he came to him, the Good Samaritan, and bandages up his wounds, the man he found, pouring oil on him and wine on them, on the wounds, he put him in his own, on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So the pouring oil here is the same word, alipheo, which is used in James. Why is that important? Alipheo means to rub or to smear. So if the oil was poured on, you'd rub this into the wounds. This is consistent with providing medical care, which is what the Good Samaritan did. Cairo is the same root for Christos, Christ, the anointed one. That's the other term used for anointing. Alepheo is used in James, not, not cryo. This seems to indicate that the oil in James was for medicinal purposes. So, if there was a spiritual meaning of a or some sort of a um, um, command or ritualistic thing to be used here, we would expect the word Cairo to be used. But no, here it's Alepheo, which is, in, as we see in Luke, is used for healing, caring. So the idea is you would pray for someone, make sure they get the right medical care as well, and then trust God to bring about the healing. And again, in the passage, regardless of where you come down on the oil, the anointing of oil, the main thing emphasized here is the prayer. That's what, that's what James says is, is so significant here about the prayer. It is the prayer that does the healing. So that's the emphasis that we want to um, bring out. 
And we see that in verses emphasized in verses 16 and 17, where the power of prayer that Elijah references is used. I'm not sure it's necessarily wrong, Julie, if someone wants to apply oil with the prayer. But what is important to remember is that there's no healing or mystical power in the oil from what James is teaching us. And I'm more comfortable saying this is referencing um, some sort of healing if someone is sick, which is consistent with what we do. When someone is dying or someone is sick, we attempt to give them medical care while we're praying for God to save them. Julie, I hope that's helpful. Uh, again, love your thoughts and feedback on this and on anyone else as well. But a really great question because I'm sure a lot of folks are thinking about that. So thanks so much, Julie. Third question is a response to the video I did on Thursday about laughter. Is our laughter coming from wisdom or the tradition of the culture around us, the tradition of entertainment? Are we being more influenced by entertainment than we are by God's wisdom? So that's the point I was trying to make. Um, and someone commented on that. I don't know this is your name. It said the, what, what the title is, is Freeblom. So um, anyway, thank you so much for uh, responding. And here's what, here's what Freeblom said. Personally, I disagree with this idea. Now, of course, definitely agree that there is a form of humor that is coarse and mean and unprofitable for the listener that we should have no part in. But I don't think all humor in the form of, say, movies or stand-up comedy is in that category, even if it is an adult in nature. As somebody who is a big fan of comedy movies and stand-up, I think it's a great blessing to hear a funny joke or a phrase that sort of surprises you and makes you see something in a different um, in, a, in a different light. I got pages mixed up here. In a different light or in a, in a ridiculous way. And that, doesn't, that, and that doesn't mean that you would at all agree with the premise or the conclusion, and usually the performer wouldn't either. And that's what makes it funny, I thought loud. I suppose it is a conscious thing, different for everybody. Thank you so much for your comment and giving me the chance to respond. I wasn't attempting to say that all humor from entertainment sources is inappropriate. What I'm trying to get at is what is the source of the humor? Humor and laughter is something that either, like everything else that we do, because remember, everything we're supposed to do is for the glory of God, places like Colossians 3.17. So what I'm saying is that humor and laughter are something that either brings honor to God or honor to us in some way. So much humor today is at the expense of other people, putting them down, envious of their position and activities, mocking them, sexual, sexual humor, quote-unquote adult humor, while funny is also something that is demeaning and not respectful of the specialness of God's gift of sex to us. Humor often shows a lack of gratitude, where a cynical attitude becomes the basis for the joke. So if we see that in roasting, we see that you know, we can make fun of someone in a humorous way, and it may be funny, technically, but if it's not coming from a place of wisdom and compassion for the person, it can do great harm. It can. We need to be aware of that. So, we can have a cynical attitude about life and make it humorous, and that denies the providence of God. And put someone else's legitimate suffering down. But notice this in Ephesians 5, verses 3 and 4. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. In other words, even in humor, there must be a sense of being grateful to God. So we can laugh and enjoy things out of a spirit of thankfulness. And we can even enjoy each other's awkwardness, as long as we're thankful for them, as long as it's not cutting or demeaning. 
much of the entertainment world is a bad source for us for this. Again, I'm not saying everything out of entertainment is wrong. We can't make a rule about this. What I am saying is that we have to be very conscious of God in everything we do, especially in the area of humor. And we tend to kind of give ourselves a pass when it comes to entertainment, when we think we're kind of taking a break now. But you're always in God's presence, and we're always to bring honor to Him. And that's not to be a burden, but to be a joy. So there's no rule here that will help us. All I'm saying is let's examine the source. We need wisdom from the words of the Holy Spirit to discern whether humor is moving us to honor and delight in God's care and in God's provision, or whether humor is influencing us to disrespect people and respect God, disrespect God. I don't know about you, but I've been in so many situations where I've said things that I thought were funny and deeply hurt someone. And I think that's because I was following more of this model of the culture and entertainment world rather than the model of really caring for someone first. So that's my thought about that. And I thank you so much for bringing that out. And I hope it's helpful. If not, let me know. I'd be happy to interact more. Because humor is a big part of our life. And it can move us in the wrong direction very quickly. Thanks again for this. And that that's the uh, Q&A Friday on Saturday for today. And uh, I'll be back with another video later, later this afternoon. Lord willing. Thanks so much for being here. You have a great day.